All right. Uh, we are here with the CEO and co-founder of Webflow, Vlad Magdalene, uh, to talk a little bit about his journey as a freelancer as we just launched the Freelancer's Journey, which is a comprehensive course that covers everything involved in growing your freelance web design business. Uh, so Vlad, thank you for being here. Of course. I'm happy to be here. In this studio, in your office. On this Charlie Rose set. <laughs> On our Charlie Rose set. <laughs> Charlie Rose set. <laughs> and uh, my name is Mariah. Um, I was one of the writers and uh, contributors for the course. And so of it is. Of course you were. <laughs> <laughs> you got three left. <laughs> Learning our quota of dad jokes and puns. Um, so the first question How did you get started as a freelancer? Um, well, first of all, I was broke and I needed money um, and I had some skills designing business cards and calendars, mm. uh, So, which was my first job out of uh, actually during high school. Uh, so I started advertising myself as a graphic designer um, and found some clients and uh, they were all terrible. Let me just say that. Like all of my clients were you know, like these Russian connections that I had from like the print shop where I used to work. And it was a, an exercise in humiliation and, uh, like just trying to scrounge together whatever contracts I could put together, but, you know, put food on the table. Um, and actually I started freelancing when I tried to get my first startup off the ground, it was called Chatterfox. Uh, and I just needed money to pay for servers and pay for living expenses. And um, like literally the only thing I knew how to do was to do graphic design and um, sort of try to make a living. And then that, that slowly worked itself into uh, a lot more of those clients needing like to turn their logo or their ad mm -hmm. into a website. Um, and picked up a book on Dreamweaver and how to build websites uh, back in the late 90s. And that's sort of one thing led to another and started getting like more and more complex projects. Um, they were all still like super low dollar amounts because all my clients were like really hardline negotiators and I sucked at negotiating. I was just like, yeah, whatever you name <laughs> as the <a> price, <laughs> I'll, I'll do. Um, but it sort of started to take off from there. And finally I got a, I got lucky enough to, to land this one client who was a dentist and just happened to have a bunch of money. And he was like, wait a second, you're underpaid. Like you're not, you're not valuing your work correctly. Uh, and that started like a, my real, what I think freelance career mm -hmm. uh where i started valuing myself a lot more um mm. as a as a professional and like the the thing i was creating and bringing to to my clients and from then on like he introduced me a couple other um business owners who also happen to be dentists sometimes orthodontists um and and that was um that just sort of became my life uh but i still wasn't making enough that um i could just like do it full time. So I had to have a full time job on the, well, this was on the side, but I had a full time job. Um, and I was supplementing uh, my income with the freelance stuff. Got it. And how old were you when you started freelancing? I think I was like seven. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's number two. Um, <laughs> I was uh, 19 or 20. Okay. Yeah, something like that. Okay. If I remember correctly. And other, through college. and other than working with difficult clients um, at the beginning of your career in freelancing, what were the greatest challenges you faced both when you were starting freelancing and then mm -hmm. as you kind of continued to get clients and grow your career? Honestly, it was like the whole feast or famine situation mm -hmm. where it's either you have like three projects at the same time and, you know, I had a bunch of issues with like time management where I wouldn't, you know, until clients start to like really call and mm -hmm. demand, um, you know, what the status was or whatever, um, I would sort of like avoid working on projects, uh, and then go into like all nighter mode, uh, and crank something out. Uh, but usually it was the, the problem, um, manifested itself as like, I was either too busy or I just didn't have any work. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was, uh, that was pretty tough. I think like, that's the main reason I got a full-time day job was because, you know, it's just not enough 
it's it's not a steady enough type of income, at mm -hmm. least for me, the way that I, I was wired in terms of like really getting down and doing work independently. I needed that kind of pressure from from clients um, that it, I sort of avoided trying to get new clients sometimes when I was mm -hmm. like busy. But that's like the, the exact time that you need to like line up future mm -hmm. future clients. Um, uh, but yeah, that was the, the biggest challenge of like consistency. And by the time, you know, like projects are over, then you get kind of desperate because you mm -hmm. need that next one and you can't be selective about the kind of uh, project you take on next because yeah. you need whatever, um, whatever pays. Uh, and that leads to like further kind of bad clients, yeah. et cetera. Um, and then over time, it sort of became um, overwhelming in the sense that I couldn't do all the work that clients demanded because I was, I was primarily like a web designer slash programmer that implemented these things. Mm -hmm. um, but I got larger and larger clients where like my level of designer didn't cut it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to find other uh, other people to like contract with uh, so that they do a better job of the design. And that's actually how I started working with Sergi, who's a Webflow co-founder. Mm -hmm. um, so he was sort of like my you know, he was a student still, and I would um, send some jobs his way, and mm -hmm. he would do the design, and then I would do the implementation. Um, so that made things a lot easier, honestly, unless your subcontractors are also busy and not reliable, um, which was sometimes the case. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And since you brought up Sergi, who is a co-founder of Webflow, um, how did your experience as a freelancer, especially the challenges you faced as a freelancer, whether it were they were creative um, or technical, uh, or even just kind of when it came down to actually running and managing that business, how did that mm -hmm. inspire you to create Webflow? Uh, well, honestly, it was a originally when Web uh, when uh, Sergi and I uh, teamed up, the company was already called Webflow. It was mm -hmm. just like Webflow LLC. It was just like my personal limited liability things or clients if they sue me they can't like go after my kids college fund which was non-existent um so the like the entity was already there mm -hmm. i think it was like the second or third iteration of like trying to start something around webflow mm -hmm. or the name webflow um but as we started working more and more together with sergi like he would do the design i would do the implementation uh, you know like setting up wordpress and joomla and drupal etc um the the biggest challenge was, you know, he was really enjoying his work because mm -hmm. it was like every project was like new and creative, a new brand, new story, new visuals, et cetera. For me, it was always the same. It was like, take this design from Photoshop mm -hmm. and like slice it up into, uh, you know, layers and write, like find some WordPress theme that looks kind of similar. Um, and it became really tedious because of like translation into code. And then once you launch, then you have all these problems of like a client needs to change. So you mm -hmm. have to go in and make the change for them, or they need some new extension and you go install that. Or like WordPress has some security bug or, um, like there's a new bug discovered in the theme. And then you, you're constantly like patching these things and mm -hmm. it just got super tedious. So Webflow came out of that. It was like, how do we, okay, here's this person, Sergi was very creative and doing like Honestly, the hard work, the work that's like hard to duplicate and mm -hmm. automate. And here I am doing like translation work um, that is repetitive for every client. Uh, and how do we empower Sergi to do uh, what we're both doing collectively mm -hmm. just by himself? Uh, like, is there is there a possibility of creating a tool that he can use while designing that will end up with the same like live site? Mm -hmm. um, sort of working myself out of a job, uh, honestly, because... <laughs> It was so tedious. It was really like it was gotten to the point where I didn't even enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so the and, and the idea was honestly just to like run the agency so that he's doing all the work and I'm making all the money um, or that, that kind of thing. It never really crossed uh, my mind in the early days of like, yeah. OK, we're going to create a product around. Huh. It. Uh, it was more like, all right, this is how our agency is going to get more competitive, more effective etc. Huh. But once we actually started like thinking through what it would look like, um, it became pretty obvious fast that it would be a, like a much more general solution that a lot more people would benefit from. Um, mm -hmm. And we figured, I think like we were maybe a little bit too optimistic that uh, people would want to pay a lot more for the software uh, than, you know, a bad client might want to pay for a website. Yeah. And it might be easier to find like, you know, tens, if not hundreds, if not millions of people to buy software. 
uh, because we saw Adobe and Dreamweaver and like uh, or like Macromedia Software and all this other uh, all these other companies taking off. So somehow, like I don't remember the exact specifics of it. Wasn't it like a one day realization? Mm-hmm. It was. It was like the more we we thought about what a pro- a product that would help us mm-hmm. as an agency, um, what that would become. It just became more and more obvious that it needs to be like we would shift from an agency to a, to a, a product hmm. company. Uh, but that presented a bunch of other yeah. questions. Like we weren't sure, okay, do we keep doing agency work and then sort of finance and bootstrap over time? And then the more we did that, uh, the more it was clear that 100% of our time, 120% of our time was being sucked into client projects. Mm-hmm. Um, so at some point we made the decision, all right, we're just going to like go all in, quit our jobs, um, try to get funding and, you know, build the actual product. Hmm. And how did uh, how did your kind of experience and kind of the challenges and the things that you took out of your freelancing career set you up for a success? I mean, maybe it was the success wasn't obvious during mm-hmm. those first few years of founding yeah. OneFlow, but when you did make that transition to really fully invest in this product, um, mm-hmm. how did your experience as a freelancer, whether it was kind of time management, if you mm-hmm. learned that eventually, or yeah, I mean, time management, honestly, for me personally. Um, having the accountability of working with another person Mm -hmm. like pushing each other that's really helpful when you're a full-on freelancer and you're just like you're the only person responsible Mm -hmm. it's a lot harder like you kind of have to motivate yourself there's no like checks and balances um so that that came pretty naturally once we started working on webflow the product uh full-time you know you're just like literally sitting next to each other it's hard to not do that it's hard to like convince yourself all right i'm gonna clean my office first uh or whatever Uh, or organize my entire Dropbox uh, folder for the 15th time. Um, So that, um, it it was pretty, like our experience as as freelancers, like building these websites uh, was paramount for for, for us understanding like what's important to build into the product. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was like, it's almost like a cheat code. Like you're, you don't, you don't need to do a lot of customer validation or customer interviews because you're the customer or like, Mm -hmm. Sergi, the designer, he's the customer, he's the person like designing the solution. Um, but he's also the consumer of that and yeah. has to uh, be the one like using it after it's created. Mm-hmm. So it, it almost was kind of like a, a cheat code because you you know the pain, you really feel it, and you can tell whether the thing that you're creating solves the pain that you mm-hmm. have. Um, and sort of the bet that we made is that other people's pain is similar yeah. and maybe it's not a unique thing to us. Um, and we sort of saw that from how many other agencies try to create like you know, their own like CMS framework Mm -hmm. and like um, something to help them be more effective. Um, So for us, it was just kind of that, that extra wind in our sails Mm -hmm. um, that informed us like, all right, we've had this past experience and I can imagine how creating this new product would have solved all those problems Mm -hmm. or most of them. Um, uh, So it was, it was a huge help. And at what point, one thing that uh, we find with freelancing, especially, I think, is that it, sometimes it often feels like what the challenges that you face as a freelancer, um, there's no validation that other freelancers are going through the same thing, I mm-hmm. think, especially when it comes to working with challenging clients or when it comes to kind of facing doubts about whether you're even doing the work you want to mm-hmm. do, especially when it comes to, you know, doubts about how you're valuing your work and how you're pricing your work and how right. other people around you are doing that. Um, as you were building Webflow and as you were trying to validate the fact that the same pain that you and Sergi felt as you were trying to build your agency and work for, you know, build sites for clients, um, how did you validate that that was a similar pain shared by other freelancers or designers? Or was that something that kind of came once you had the product itself? Um, so a couple a couple things. Um, one is we didn't have any data from like other freelancers on like what to charge, et cetera. Like at that time, there were no, or at least that I remember reading like all these resources or blog posts around like how to value your work, et cetera. In fact, all the signals we got were negative because, uh, you know, we would make a pitch to a client and the client would say, oh, we got this other thing. Yeah. And the only thing that they would reveal about it is the price or like the budget. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, 30% lower or 50% lower or whatever. So that's our only data point. And, yeah. and that, who knows if that was even real. Uh, and that was like, that made us question, okay, maybe we should like, you know, go in mm-hmm. and undercut that price or whatever. Mm-hmm. So we didn't have many, you know, role models or, and nor did we really spend a lot of time thinking about that. Cause I think the, the way that we were treated by most of our clients was like this sort of, you know, you're just here to 
do this job. There's not like a, a mutual, there's more of a power dynamic of like, yeah. you need me more than uh, you're like the clients would imply that we need them more than they need us, which is like kind of felt true in a mm-hmm. way because, you know, we need to make money and mm-hmm. uh, it's sort of not in a position to, to push back, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that was, um, I forgot the original question. How did you validate you know, oh, yeah, like creating so, a product right, out of right, some right. of those kind of pains so, that you know you were yeah, feeling? Yeah, so so we knew at least that um, uh, like in the process of creating, you know, a website mm-hmm. or um, like a landing page or a product or whatever, we knew that the the outcome was the same with something like Webflow. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was like pretty clear that if you deliver the same thing that you were doing in code. Um, it's going to be valuable, just as valuable as, as what we're doing before. Mm-hmm. And maybe you're you're able to do it faster, which means it saves us time and we can charge the same amount, um, et cetera. Uh, but the other thing that we were lucky um, to have additional input on was I, for a time, took a job at another agency mm-hmm. and happened to see the invoice that um, like they were charging their clients. And it was a much bigger, like they had much bigger clients. They had like Apple and HP and like Quicksilver and all these things. Um, and I happened to see like how much they were charging. And it was like in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm. Uh, so at some point I had like that additional data of like, um, you know, this stuff is really valuable, but still convinced myself that, okay, it's because they have like these art directors and, you know, this crazy hosting um, uh, kind of infrastructure and, and the whole value add of like UX architecture and prototyping mm-hmm. and whatever. So it never really like crossed into the, um, you know, realm of being applicable to me. Um, and, and I think that was like, I wish more freelancers like had that, um, like either mentorship from other like more established freelancers mm-hmm. or people who have more experience uh, working with clients, like valuing their work correctly, protecting their time, uh, being like, you, you know, um, learning how to negotiate better, mm-hmm. et cetera. I think now there's a lot more examples of that, but it's still tough. I think like I, I talked yeah. to some, some people who, you know, were friends of mine who charge 10 times more than I was charging and they still are underpaid, yeah. uh, are still undervaluing. Um, and, and it's like a combination of like, can you get the right client? Is the timing right? Is, uh, is your skill set a match for what, like the kind of projects that you're getting? Um, I think it's I think it's tough. Like it doesn't get easier. Yeah. Even with you know new platforms and new, um, you know more access to advertise your services on the on the internet, etc. That like there's so many more freelancers now that the competition is bigger um, or like more um, vast. Uh, and yeah, I think the the dream as a freelancer is to sort of break out to where you can yeah. be like independent, but also have like a steady uh, stream of clients who respect and value your work and um you have you know autonomy um or how you do the work as long as you deliver um but you know when you're in the thick of it it doesn't feel that way you're just like trying to trying to get more projects and get them done and move on to the next thing and we talk about this a little bit in the course but when we talk about kind of pricing services and now that you've been Out of freelancing, you've had the experience of a lot of Webflow's customers are agencies, they're freelancers, Mm -hmm. and especially in the Webflow community, I'm sure that's one of the online communities of many that I've seen discussions Mm -hmm. around pricing your services happening in the open, which Mm -hmm. is um, combating a bit of like the, you know, the race to the bottom of Right. Every freelancer assuming that to compete for clients, they have to decrease their prices mm-hmm. um, when that doesn't really benefit anyone. And I wonder what advice you have now having seen kind of like the bird's eye view of having all these freelancers as customers and agencies and seeing them build careers and websites on uh, Webflow. What advice do you have for a freelancer who's trying to navigate that space of figuring out how to price their work yeah. um, and what that looks like? I think... Ultimately, you want to get to pricing by value. So, mm-hmm. for example, if you create something that is, you know, it could take you like literally a second or maybe 20 minutes to create a logo, just exaggerating. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the value that that has to a, a business, for example, to a step to be like the underpinning of their brand and mm-hmm. identity, et cetera, that's really valuable. So that's yeah. why you see like the best logo designers in the world, like, they don't charge based on hours, Mm -hmm. they charge based on value. Mm -hmm. And same thing um, that you start to see with like more web design projects and more kind of like branding projects and like communications type of projects where it's, you want to align with, um, it still has to be 
it has to make sense for the business, right? Like mm-hmm. if they were to go hire a person and, you know, train them and have them do the same work, like mm-hmm. I think it, it still has to, you have to bring a level of like, we're going to get it done sooner and faster. And, um, and you like, there's a, there's an incentive to not try to do it in house. Mm-hmm. Uh, but ultimately as a freelancer, if you can like sell your services or sell your value add as a, uh, a function of like what value that brings to the, to the clients, that's, mm-hmm. that's a win-win for everyone because it's easy for the, for the business to justify it. Cause like, okay, we can see how this, whatever $10,000 website is going mm-hmm. to bring us at least $20,000 of like new customers, et cetera. Uh, or we're missing out on, on all this traffic if we don't have a good brand presence, et cetera. Um, you really don't want to, um, I know sometimes it's necessary, but mm-hmm. especially as you're sort of just starting out, but you typically don't want to uh, price your work just on hours because then it gets into like this sort of micromanaged, um, you know, tiny bit of work for a small amount of money or whatever. Um, it just doesn't, I don't know, doesn't accurately portray the the full scope of what's being created mm-hmm. and the value of it. Um, so, and that's not always perfect. Like sometimes you can have projects that, you, you know, you negotiate a specific price um, based on like the agreed upon value. Mm-hmm. And then as you get into the weeds, you realize, oh, holy crap, there's just a lot more work um, that's necessary to do that. Sometimes it's the opposite, right? Like where, you know, it's, it's a surprise how, how, um, like how many hours it took to deliver something Mm -hmm. of, of, um, great value. Uh, and I think when, I think clients, a good clients really respect when freelancers are like stand up for what they believe in and stand up for the value of their work. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're, they're firm around, um, like the constraints because a lot of clients will push boundaries like okay here's here's the the big thing we want to do and here's mm-hmm. our budget right and then you sort of agree on that on that thing mm-hmm. and then on a follow-up uh, phone call they might say oh there we had this other idea right sort of mm-hmm. like not mentioning the budget again and um good clients at least respect when when that designer will say well that sounds like a um an increase in scope like mm-hmm. we can talk about that as an extension to our uh, to our arrangement, et cetera, or we need to remove some other scope mm-hmm. to make sure there's, uh, like it's appropriate to what we agree to. Um, and it's only bad clients who will like sort of demand and push back. And, mm-hmm. um, uh, but it's really, um, on the freelancer to like really stand up for that and like set those boundaries. Yeah. Um, and I think that, um, that only leads to like a deepening of a relationship between a client and a freelancer because, um, you then, have this mutual understanding of like what, what a freelancer is helping create is inherently mm-hmm. valuable. And there's like a, um, fair exchange of value and, and services and money, et cetera. Um, but it's like, you know, easy to say yeah. and, uh, in practice it's a lot harder yeah. because it, it requires candor and negotiation and speaking up for yourself and, yeah. um, being clear and direct and, um, you know, not letting people walk over, uh, walk over you, et cetera, just yeah. because they're in like in the position to pay you, et cetera. And probably saying no to, to some clients yeah. when they're unwilling yep, to exactly. pay you a certain amount. Yeah. That's sort of like the 80, 20 rule. Like sometimes you can get, um, a client that gives you 20% of your revenue, but mm-hmm. pre- presents 80% of your problems. Yeah. Um, and I've had clients like that and like, you know, you agree to them begrudgingly, but then you regret it yeah. pretty much the entire time. Um, because there's constant scope creep. There's constant, like, trouble with getting paid Mm -hmm. you know they just flat out don't don't value all all of what you bring to the table yeah like they they see you as like a resource or like something or somebody to take advantage of um and that's unfortunate and we talk a lot about a lot of these things um in the course kind of around pricing work getting clients even meeting potential clients saying no to free work and what differentiates these course from a lot of the video courses that we've created before mm-hmm. is that much of it actually has nothing to do with Webflow. Uh, mm-hmm. We use Webflow as a tool in the course to build a client site, but it's the first education piece of educational content that we've really invested in as a company that is for freelancers, whether mm-hmm. or not they use Webflow. Yep. And my question for you would be, why was this something that you and your team chose to invest in? Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of why now, maybe? Yeah. Uh, well, for us, it's the freelancers are the foundation of our company. Like we, we started as freelancers. 
most of our customers are freelancers. Um, Webflow is a, uh, a, for a lot of freelancers, especially people coming in with like no code background, mm -hmm. it is a fundamentally empowering technology that takes them from um, not being able to practice like this entire trade mm -hmm. of uh, web design and web development to being able to do that. And mm -hmm. we believe that um, by inspiring more people to, you know, be in control of their own destiny, start their own like small business, start mm -hmm. their own agency, start their own um, solo uh, kind of venture uh, to see if they can, you know, make something real and, mm -hmm. and like solve a problem for other people. We believe that just by extension, they'll end up using Webflow anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't have to like... Uh, push our our product necessarily um uh we just want to empower more people to like know that this is an option yeah. um that they can um and it's a growing one like it used to be something that was um kind of more fringe mm -hmm. um and it was seen as a uh you know kind of like a second resort maybe uh, but now it's it's so there's so many um advantages to being independent mm -hmm. um and especially if you can um like build your own brand and start to, like to build your customer list and and start to do the kind of work that you really enjoy doing mm -hmm. um it's just like a, a wonderful option to make a living um and with this course uh we wanted to inspire more people to take that first leap um, and, and the web happens to be the most powerful, like, you know, we could, we could have made a, a course that is more targeted at like freelancers of difference, like maybe, mm -hmm. you know, graphic designers potentially, um, on, or even something more like less tech oriented. Um, there's many different ways, like you can run a, I don't know, fitness freelance sort mm -hmm. of consultancy or whatever. Um, but the web is this new powerful medium that a lot of creative people don't have access to us aside from like these sort of uh closed um walled gardens like you know being able to contribute content to youtube or medium or whatever um it's very hard to make something of your own without mm -hmm. a developer so we um we see all this untapped potential of like this huge medium that um is really only being um tapped by developers and people who know how to code so um we believe that there's way way more creative people out there that mm -hmm. if given the opportunity given the right tools uh will be able to figure out how to kind of you know chart their own destiny and mm -hmm. and create their own business and get their own clients and do like work that they love doing um and there's a lot of these practical things on like how to land clients how to yeah. negotiate how to do like um you know, how to invoice them and how to do the actual work um, that we hope is going to be helpful in this course. Um, and of course, we want people to use Webflow and be successful with it. Um, and if that results from, from people watching this course, great. If, if people are inspired to become freelancers and eventually start using Webflow, also great. People like learn something and it benefits them um, and uh, Webflow is not for them. We, we still are super happy that we're able to bring some like new information or education mm -hmm. and um, that just helps people have good vibes with our brand and uh, maybe they'll tell somebody else about it in the future. That's a better fit. So awesome. And what, how do you think that uh, this course kind of fits into the dual missions of Webflow and what are those dual missions? Uh, I forget. Just kidding. <laughs> um, so yes, Webflow has two missions, two side-by-side -side missions. Uh, one is to empower everyone to create software without code, so without having to learn how to code. Um, and the second one is to create the kind of company where each individual team member can live an impactful and fulfilling life. Um, and for us, this is, I mean, the, the freelancer course is infused in that. Like, we want to empower everyone. So anybody that wants to... Mm -hmm. um, build for the web, build something meaningful, like start to learn how to um, take advantage um, of this amazing new medium that you can literally like create something and have it live to the, for the entire world to see mm -hmm. um, just because of the power of the internet, right? Like no, no longer do you have to like go in front of a somebody and pitch something. Um, mm -hmm. You you can create, you know, a website or a product and put it up on like Product Hunt or like advertise it some other way. Um, and it's all about empowerment. It's all about democratization. It's all about taking a skill that is, uh, right now performed by one out of every 400 people. It's like 0.25% mm -hmm. 
which is like a really ridiculously low number, um, and and bringing that power to a lot more people. And I think that is going to happen, you know, by focusing on the everyone part. It's not just for like big companies. It's not for enterprises. Uh, it could be, um, but it's also like one individual, mm-hmm. one person who has like a creative vision. And they 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 want to uh, make something for the web. They they can make it happen, and we want to empower them with. Um, with this course and with our tools and et cetera. Um, and the other, the other mission um, around creating fulfillment and impact, um, we want to see the same thing for our team members and our community as well. Like mm-hmm. um, people who are in, in um, you know, who can become part of the Webflow community or could be Webflow uh, creators, et cetera. Um, we want them to do the kind of work that they feel is fulfilling so of course if you're like a really creative person it's it's much um it sounds more um fulfilling to be able to work on like all these creative projects and like create these solutions for uh potential clients rather than something a little bit more you know like potentially less meaningful Mm -hmm. like driving a lift Mm -hmm. or whatever um and we want to offer people more options Mm -hmm. like how do we how do we get uh, people to pursue their dreams and create what they want to create uh, and put them in the driver's seat. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I guess in Lyft, they would also be in the driver's seat. <laughs> Does it make any sense? This analogy Unless is all broken. Unless it's a self-driving yeah. car. <laughs> Ooh, too far. <laughs> too uh, soon, maybe. Yeah, too soon. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I think free, uh, like the the ethos behind the company is to empower more and more people, like Mm -hmm. empower the individual. Mm -hmm. Um, And ultimately, like, even though freelancer um, arrangements sometimes go into like small agencies and bigger agencies, at the end of the day, most are uh, like these solo entrepreneurs and um, creatives that, um, that are companies of one. Mm -hmm. And, And we want to make sure that they're doing work that they find fulfilling and interesting and valuable um, like that work is valuable to other businesses mm-hmm. that they're, you know, willing to pay for it. Uh, so it's kind of like this virtuous cycle of like, mm-hmm. there's a, whoops, my phone is going off. Um, there's like a virtual cycle of, um, you know, people needing this valuable skill yeah. and, and you being empowered to, to create, uh, in this new medium. Awesome. And yeah, I know that we have a lot of freelancers who, or people in our company who are working for Webflow now who either have been freelancers mm-hmm. or are still doing freelancing on the side. So I know yeah. that, um, especially for those that contributed to the course, this has been extremely um, impactful and meaningful work for them just because uh, it's so close to their experience as creatives. Um, and uh, what is your vision for the future of freelance web designers? <sighs> Self-driving cars. <laughs> um that i mean the it's kind of a summarization of what i said before I like i want to see more power in mm-hmm. the hands of individuals um it shouldn't take an entire company of people to create a new product uh or get an idea off the ground mm-hmm. uh, i believe that there's so many people who have um you know like some some like dream of creating an app or, or a solution or Mm -hmm. like a product or a service or a social network or whatever. There's so many different avenues. Like we were just now scratching the surface. Um, and because that barrier to entry is so high, you have to form a company, you have to like find developers, you have to go to like a boot camp to, to learn this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, that it just takes months, if not years to, to build like the set of skills and, um, set of people to to make that happen. Mm-hmm. And already it's lower than maybe what it was 20 years ago, right? When you had to, you know, buy like physical computers and now you can go to Amazon and mm-hmm. rent them, et cetera. Um, I mean, for like servers and stuff. Uh, but it's still so far away from, you know, I have an idea for a product and um, as a non-programmer or non-coder, I can actually make it real. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that um, the future of, design, whether it's web design or application design or um, is going to be driven a lot by like individuals mm-hmm. who just have an idea and are able, they have the right tools um, in their toolbox to be able to do it themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where tool, like um, applications like Webflow really come into play where they take a lot of complexity and boil it down into something that's mm-hmm. a lot more human, a lot more relatable and understandable and easier to learn, uh, where you can go through maybe a three-hour course mm-hmm 
or um, you know a few weeks of like intensive training and come out being able to create the same kind of products that you were able to create after a six month or nine month mm-hmm. or 12 month like coding boot camp 12 months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's I, I really see the future being a lot more um, fundamentally empowering, like more people have access to this, this mm-hmm. kind of thing. And you can think of it as like very similar to um, kind of what happened with like movie studios and YouTube, mm-hmm. um, where you had to have access to a studio and like production crew and, you know, financing, et cetera, you know, 40 years ago or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you still need that to make like these huge budget movies. But now we have millions, if not tens of millions of people, if not hundreds of millions of people uh, creating new content mm-hmm. on like YouTube and other platforms where that barrier to entry has just been squashed. Mm-hmm. And and from that, we get like tens of millions of like new ideas mm-hmm. um, and things that that just would not have seen the light of day if that barrier to entry stayed the same. And the movie is, industry is still thriving. Like it's yeah. still, it's not like some something had to be, you know, destroyed for this new value mm-hmm. to be created. Um, and that's similar to what we see um, empowering a lot more people to do with the web mm-hmm. and creating for the web uh, by creating tooling that's um, is so much easier than than learning how to code. Uh, so. Yeah, so that's you know a lot of a lot of freelancers being more empowered, creating mm-hmm. a lot more awesome products and services and websites and ideas that uh, you know we just can't even imagine today. Um, and of course, they do that all with Webflow. Uh, but <laughs> everyone's but, using yeah, Webflow. <laughs> exactly. uh, but it doesn't even have to be that. I'd rather see you know um, similar to three D animation software, yeah. right? Like we now have a lot of different players in the space, but like there's this shared language between how you create models and and do animation and do like particle effects mm-hmm. or whatever. But the important thing is like, we're getting a lot more movies, a lot more stories being told. Um, and, and I think the, the web is just now at this like beginning renaissance where um, the vast majority of the world still doesn't have access to creating for it. Mm-hmm. And we're just now scratching the surface to um, kind of opening up those floodgates to creativity and imagination, et cetera. And I think over the next like 10, 20 years, we're going to see a lot of things be completely different um, and a lot of paradigms um, just shifted from our like current assumptions mm-hmm. that you need to have like skill XYZ to do a certain thing. Um, but yeah, it's exciting. Uh, I think we have a lot of work a- ahead to like meet that challenge yeah. and, and like provide those tools and, and build um, what we need to build. But I think it just puts a lot more hands into um the hands of freelancers, which gives them more power, which gives them more flexibility, uh, which hopefully gives them more fulfillment and fun and mm-hmm. enjoyment, etc. So awesome. And my last question for you um, is, do you have any advice for freelance web designers out there other than to find a dentist who's going to pay them a lot of money and them to increase <laughs> their rates, and maybe clean their teeth? <laughs> uh, uh, do I have any advice? Use Webflow. Uh-huh. <laughs> Um, I think it, I would kind of go back to that, um, that idea of really valuing, like finding worth in your own mm-hmm. work and not, not doing the work of devaluing your work yourself. Like, mm-hmm. um, I think that was my inclination of just always assuming that what I was creating wasn't good enough and doing the work on behalf of clients to sort of like devalue Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I was creating. Um, So the, the best, most successful freelancers I've seen have crossed this barrier of like, you know, realizing, yes, what I, you know, I, I have talent. I have like, there's value that I bring to the table Mm -hmm. um, overriding this, you know, like nagging imposter syndrome or whatever that we all uh, deal with. Um, and, and really, even when you're uncomfortable with something like pitching a project that is, you know, higher than you think that somebody is willing to pay, uh, still, um, like always remembering in the back of your head that you wouldn't even be talking to this client if they didn't need what you need. Mm -hmm. Um, and you'd be surprised how, how many times like that client will even think, okay, that's way lower than Mm -hmm. what this is worth for us and totally makes sense. Um, so, um, yeah, just. I guess, believe in yourself. <laughs> Easy. Uh, yeah. Anyone can do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and just stand up for the value that you're creating. And I think that that will, that will help you a make more money, which B will help you be more selective mm-hmm. in your uh, clients, which only will lead to like more valuable mm-hmm. projects. Um, and then everyone wins. Um, I think. 
And do you have any dentist jokes? <laughs> Putting me on the spot. Um, I don't know if we should drill into that whole um, can of worms. Brace yourself. <laughs> that was an orthodontist joke. <laughs> Snuck it in there. Uh, I wish I had more. I don't think yeah. I can. Huh? I don't think. None of mine are clean enough for yeah. <laughs> camera. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for your time and uh, the joke contributions. That was great. However Self-driving car were. plugs and Webflow plugs, of course. Um, we're really excited about this course, and uh, Vlad and the team have made it possible for us to create it. So thank you for being here, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Cooking. Awesome. Cooking. <laughs> Cooking. <laughs> Cooking up some better jokes. <laughs> Cooking up some better jokes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>